That's what it means to be Lord. He's the owner. He owns us. Amen. Folks, if you'll turn the book of Genesis with me tonight, please. Book of Genesis, chapter number 8, verse 20. Genesis 8, 20. In the Hebrew Bible, you don't have the word Genesis. It's not in the Hebrew Bible. What you have in the Hebrew Bible is Bereshith. And that word Bereshith in Hebrew simply means uh, in the beginning, the source of. And of course, we give it the word in English, Genesis. You know, the word Genesis in English means that. It means the source of or the beginning, the root of. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 8 and verse number 20, therefore, we find the book of Genesis, the beginnings of so many things, first mentioned, things started, and so forth. And uh, if you didn't have the book of Genesis, you wouldn't have the foundation for the rest of the Bible. The book of Genesis lays that foundation. For example, if you didn't have Genesis, you wouldn't have a clue who Abraham was. And there's talking about him. So in verse 20, it says, And Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord, the Lord God Jehovah, smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. In plainer words, the flood didn't change anything. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth seed time and harvest and cold and, and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. That's called the Noahide covenant. If you're going to uh, talk to a Jew about becoming a, a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what he'll do more than likely is to get you to come under a Noahide covenant. In other words, a covenant between Jehovah and the Gentiles in general. And he'll try to get you to do that. If you pursue it and push it further, then you can become a proselyte into Judaism. You can be seated. In Genesis chapter number 8 and verse 20, the first time the Bible, the word altar shows up is here. It doesn't mean it's the first altar, but it's the first time the word shows up. So it falls under the category of first mention. And that is definitely a viable method of interpreting the Bible. It's called the law of first mention. The first time something shows up in the Bible, you look very carefully at the context, and you'll be amazed at how you learn so many things that are complemented throughout the rest of the Bible. The word altar here is in the new world, for Noah had already passed from the old world into the new world across the flood, and he was giving an altar of thanksgiving. That's what this altar is. It's a burnt offering of thanksgiving. He's offering up thanks to God for his providential care and the fact that he's brought him from the old world into the new world. And so when Noah does this, of course he does it with the limited understanding that he has of the Lord. Uh, I'm going to bring you a message soon on how God has progressively revealed himself and the plan of salvation in the book of Genesis and throughout the Bible. It's important to understand that because once you understand that, you'll understand the contemporary situation around it at the time. It's, uh, it's easy for us to look back at Noah and say, well, Noah believed in the cross and he was a believer in Christ and all of that. Well, he had the Spirit of Christ in him as far as prophecy was concerned and all of that. But Noah did no more understand the death of Christ on the cross than, uh, than, than, uh, than, uh, than Hosea would have or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. They knew it was coming in a fogged sense, but not the full revelation that came with the actual coming of Christ into the world to die on the cross. This is why the Apostle Peter said, not so, Lord, when he was going to be crucified. He said, not so, Lord. They fought it. And the reason they did is because they couldn't comprehend the Lord going to a cross and dying for our sins. Even though the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, that we look back, we can understand it. In the 22nd Psalm, as we look back, we can understand it. But our perspective is past the event, looking back on the event. So Noah builds an altar to the Lord. He chooses to do this. If you'll notice in the Old Testament, before the priesthood ever showed up, men individually chose to draw nigh to God and, know, and their relationship with the Lord. It's an individual thing. And that's the way God intends for it to be, always has, always will. Before the priesthood ever came into being, we have Noah offering 
a sacrifice unto God. So the, worst, the first time altar shows up is in Genesis 8. In Genesis chapter number 6 and verse 18, another word shows up. And this is the kind of word that just jumps off of the paper. Genesis 6 and verse 18. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Covenant. Understand that a covenant is, uh, is, is, a, is an agreement, varies depending on what covenant it is, between two people. Get that ingrained in your heart tonight. A covenant is between two. It's between two. But God made some covenants and no man was able to comprehend or even be part of what he was doing. So he made it with himself swore by his own name and brought it into being. We'll talk about that later. That's a big deal because God intended to do something. Man's not going to stop him. So here in the book of Genesis, he had a covenant and the covenant he, he ordained with Noah. The reason he ordained it with Noah is because Noah is the federal head of humanity. He's the leader of all humanity. It was Noah that builded the ark. Shem, Ham, and Japheth are his sons. But Noah's the patriarch, and so God brings, brings Noah into a covenant relationship with him. Covenant's a big deal. It's a very big deal. As we read about covenants in the Old Testament, God made a covenant with Abraham. And that covenant has certain rules, regulations, benefits, and blessings associated with it. It lasts a certain period of time with a certain people or person. In this case, Genesis 12, God made a covenant with one man, and that man was Abram that he called out of Ur of the Chaldees. We today, according to the book of Galatians, benefit greatly from the covenant that God made with Abram. That covenant was a blessed thing. But now Abram had in, the, in his household an Egyptian handmaid. She was a servant to his wife, Sarah. And they hadn't had any children. And the promise of God that he would have a child had gone over 10 years and no child was born. And so Sarah says to her husband, take mine handmaid, Hagar, and raise up children by her. And so they figured out this is what God wants us to do. We're going to figure it out and we're going to help the Lord out here and we're going to get this thing done. And they went ahead and did it. Abraham uh, impregnated Hagar. She bore a son. His name was Ishmael. But when she was impregnated, we had a problem arise between Sarah and Hagar. The Bible says that Hagar was despised in the eyes of Sarah when she became pregnant. Sarah wanted something that she really didn't want because once Hagar became pregnant, Sarah realized real fast the problem wasn't with Abraham. The problem was with her and her relationship and what God was about to do in this family. And so jealousy immediately entered in and she spoke harsh and she treated Hagar hard and Hagar fled from the face of Abraham and Sarah. But then here again, we've got a covenant between God and Abraham. Now something beautiful shows up. Look over here in the book of Genesis chapter number 16. Hagar has fled into the wilderness. Genesis 16, 6, And Abram said to Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Remember now, she's pregnant, but she hadn't had a child yet. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou? Whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to thy mistress, submit thyself to her hands. The angel of the Lord said, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but Hagar found grace too. This is pure grace. Because Hagar is not under a covenant relationship with the Lord. You're about to find out something about the heart of God. Now put that down in your heart and think about that as you continue to study your Bible. 
Even though this Egyptian handmaid did not choose her situation in life, she didn't choose to do that with Abraham. She was cast into that place, and she, and by no fault of her own, she becomes pregnant. And anyone would have, and, and Sarah was ready to kick her out into the wilderness, but not God. Not God. Not God. When I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, Live. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. We're under a covenant relationship with the Lord right now. That covenant is a blood covenant. But there's an awful lot of them out there that have never heard about the blood. They've never heard about Him. They know nothing of the gospel of Christ. No, absolutely nothing. They live in pagan, ignorance, and blind, alienated from the life of God. Aren't you glad that you can see instances like this and circumstances that begin to reveal the heart of God? This is, the, this is to me, this is a marvelous thing because she had no relationship with the Lord. The only thing she knew about Him is what she knew about Him through Sarah and Abram. And it wasn't much, was it? So he showed up to her when she was cast out into the wilderness and made himself known personally and directly to her. In the book of Genesis chapter number 4 and verse 7, we know the story of Cain and Abel. And notice what it says in verse number 7. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now look what you're reading carefully. <clears throat> this is the first time that word shows up in the Bible. Sin lieth at the door. Let me ask you a question this morning, tonight. Is this the first time sin showed up in the Bible? No. This is the first time the word shows up in the Bible. And look carefully at the context and what was said. God's talking to Cain. Cain had just been rejected for he had come to an altar. And at that altar he had offered, just as Abel had offered, but he had offered a different sacrifice. His sacrifice was offered according to his heart. The Bible says plainly in Hebrews chapter number 11 that Abel had a more excellent sacrifice because he offered blood. But here we find Cain rejected, but not completely rejected. He's rejected, but not completely rejected. God is willing to, to uh, talk to him reason with him. As he says in Isaiah, come now let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Don't ever let some preacher get up and browbeat you into believing that if you don't cross all your T's and dot all your I's according to the way he says it and he sees it and he preaches it, that you can't have a relationship with the Lord. Don't ever let anybody intimidate you like that. Your relationship with the Lord is a personal individual thing. Now listen carefully. This is the most important thing about your, your relationship with the Lord. Your relationship with the Lord is built upon the truth that you know in your heart and your willingness to stand to it and come to Him in truth. You may be, and we are all of us, ignorant of so many things of God. Ignorant of it. But that doesn't stop the Lord from receiving you if you come to Him in honesty and sincerity and the truthfulness of your heart. And so we find here, God says to Cain, Listen, Cain, if you do well, you'll be accepted. In plain words, I haven't rejected you completely. And finally, this is temporary. But here's what he said about sin. Look carefully at it. He said, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. There's a lot of different interpretations on this. Look carefully what you're reading. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, when you read that, you say to yourself, my, what's said here? What was just said here? Most commentaries say sin offering, and they try to run this thing off into a direction that makes no sense whatsoever. But look at it carefully. Just take what it says. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Is Cain going to rule over sin? No. Sin will rule over Cain. And the desire will be of Cain towards sin, and sin will rule. God was warning Cain, don't go further, Cain. If you do, this will become your master. And that's the way sin operates. Once you go down the path, it will become your master. 
This is the message. This is the first time it shows up in the Bible. The first time the word shows up in the Bible, it's a clear warning. Don't mess with it, for it will master you. And when it masters you, it will destroy you. James said plainly, sin when it is finished bringeth forth. In Genesis 5 verse 1, here's the first time the word generation shows up in the Bible. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Now Adam is a generic term. Adam, many times in the, New Te in the, in the book of Genesis, is a reference to the man who was made from the dust of the ground. But in some occasions, Adam is a reference to mankind, both male and female. If you'll remember, the Bible says when he made them, he called their name Adam. So you've got to understand, in Hebrew terminology, Adam refers to mankind, although the word Adam can also be the, can be the personal name of an individual. And the Bible says this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. It's remarkable what you find here. Go to Genesis 5, and I want you to look at something that, uh, that uh, to me is very instructive. Genesis 5, verse number 14. Let's go back to, uh, well, let's just, let, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's just go all the way back to verse 5 and get the years of Adam. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. And what does it say? He died. Now notice, this is the generations of Adam. This is the generations of mankind. And he died. And he died. And he died. Verse 8, and he died. Verse 11, and he died. Verse 14, and he died. And he died. And he died. Now look at chapter number 4. And verse number 16. This is the first man ever born on the earth. Cain. Cain wasn't made like Adam. He was born. Notes carefully. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built it a city. And he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Ired, Ired beget Mahujael, Mahujael beget Methusael, Methusael beget Lamech, and Lamech took unto him two wives, and on it goes. And what you find as you read on down through the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis, there's something missing that's in the fifth chapter of Genesis. A glaring omission. What is it? What's missing between the fifth chapter and the fourth chapter? What's missing? There's something missing. Look at the genealogies. Careful now. Look at them carefully. You got all these names, and they bore this one, this one begat this one, this one bore this one, this one had this one, this one had this one. Chapter four. Chapter five, this one had this one, this one had this one, this one had this one, this one had this one. Pardon? That's it. And he died is missing from chapter four. Not a single one of these people are recorded as dying. Now, did they die? Yes, they died. Of course they died. But you see, the death of the individual is the consummation of their life on this earth in humanity before God. But the descendants of Cain don't even get that honor to record their death. That's quite a remarkable thing, don't you think? I want you to notice something else. In chapter number 5 and verse number 1, the book of the generations of who? Adam. Why isn't Cain in there? Cain's the son of Adam. Unless, of course, you get off into what uh, a lot of theory. <laughs> like this one over here in John 8, 44. Hold your place in Genesis. <coughs> John 8, 44. <coughs> I'm not going to get off into it tonight. I just want to put this out here for you to look at. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father, the devil. So I said, well, it's, you know, that means that they are rebellious and that they are 
unbelievers, and, and on it goes. Well, they certainly were rebellious, rebellious, and they certainly are unbelievers. But it's remarkable that in Genesis chapter number 4 and 5, they're not even included in the genealogy of Adam, are they? And the Lord said to them in John 8, 44, You're of your father the devil. But anyway, that's one of those strange things in the Bible, isn't it? Is it, kind of, is it enough to make you go home, scratch your head, and do a little digging? <laughs> uh, let me give you just a little bit of the theory. The theory is, one theory, Jewish source, is that Adam had relationship with a demon named Lilith and produced a, a race from it. Another one is that Eve had a relationship with Satan and had seed from that, which is called serpent seed, and on it goes. I'm not telling you that I believe either one of them, but I'm telling you I've read it, and I've read a lot of it, and uh, a lot of what they have to say. One man teaches that the sons of Cain are Kenites, and being Kenites, they are, they are cursed, but he teaches also that it's possible that they can be saved. I just want you to see that the Bible has something to say about the origins of everything. That's what the book of Genesis is about. It's about origins. Now, I want you to look at this one here tonight with me. Chapter 2, verse 2. This is where we're going to park just a little while. In Genesis 2, 2. Genesis chapter number 2 and verse 2. In Genesis 2, 1, the Bible said, And the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended His work, which He had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. All right? The word rest here doesn't mean that God's tired. It means he ceases. He's finished. That's what the word rest means. Finished. That's important. Finished. His work was done. He rested from what he was doing. Now in chapter number 4 of the book of Hebrews, you'll find a New Testament commentary on that in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, one of my favorite books in all the Bible, folks. Hebrews is a profound book. In Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse 4, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now, the writer of Hebrews is going to go back to what happened, what you just read in Genesis 2-2, and he's going to make an application of it. He's going to make an application of that rest. It's important to see how he does this, and that's probably Paul who wrote this thing, but he's applying it. Now, don't you think that's a remarkable thing when you see a New Testament writer take something that happened in the Old Testament thousands of years before and apply it? See? What he's applying here in Hebrews chapter number 4 took place over 2,000 years before. That would be like me taking something that happened in the New Testament and applying it today and giving, a, giving it a doctrinal meaning. I don't have that authority. Only an apostle has that kind of an authority. You're following me tonight. The Bible said, all, no prophecy of the Scriptures, any private interpretation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's inspiration. You don't just take it upon yourself to write Scripture. A lot have. And that's where you get apocryphal writings, you get pseudepigraphic writings, you get all this stuff. But only an apostle could write Scripture. One sent forth with the same commission that Christ was sent forth when He was sent forth from the Father to this earth anointed of God, the apostle is sent forth, and that apostle writes Scripture. Now, if you don't believe that tonight, what books make up your Bible? What authority do you turn to? Do you turn to the Dead Sea Scrolls? I turn to the Dead Sea Scrolls and appreciate where they may complement the Scripture, but I don't turn to the Dead Sea Scrolls and what these may have been the Essenes, they're not even sure who it was, wrote these things uh, as the same as Scripture. Because it's not. Scripture, 66 books, and it ends with a book of, uh, with a book of Revelation. Right. So, in Hebrews he said, rest. Now, he's going to apply this. Watch how he does it. Chapter number 4 and verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. See that? 
the ceasing from his works. Nothing about being tired. He ceases from his works. Now he's talking to Hebrews. He's talking to people that were, were you know, well versed in temple worship, temple sacrifices, a priesthood. And the thing is you need to understand that this priesthood was a continuing day in, day out, day in, day out. The priest work was never done. He was never finished. He was never, never, ever, ever finished. And one of the reasons, because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It cannot cleanse the conscience. It cannot give you peace in your heart. But here's how, here's how Paul deals with it. He that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Look at verse 14. Seeing then, now watch how he introduces an element here. We have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Yes. Our faith, our faith, the fact that we are born again tonight, we hold fast to that because we have a high priest. Right. See the connection? Your salvation, your faith is directly connected with a high priest. And now notice how the book of Hebrews develops that. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter number, uh, Hebrews chapter number uh, 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 2 and verse number 10. Hebrews 2.10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The, this is the qualification for his priesthood. He did not come down a priest. He became a priest by the order of Almighty God who swore to himself again that he would be a priest. This priesthood is entirely different from anything made on earth. Hebrews 2.17 Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, made like unto them, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Not only is there the work of Christ as the high priest, therefore the sacrifice, the blood atonement that brings us to God, but there is the place of Christ before God the Father, that place that he holds right now, the scripture says here that he, to, to things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation of the sins of the people. Now Hebrews 4.14, we just read it. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. The Old Testament high priest was never called a great high priest. He's called the high priest. Aaron, of course, was the first high priest, but he's not called a great high priest. Why? Because he's not the great high priest. Amen. Hebrews 5, 9. Now watch this. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now compare that to Hebrews 2, 10, where it says, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Then in Hebrews 5, 9, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Verse 10, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now there's a lot of things here you could say, but I want to move along. I want to, you know, I don't have all night with this, but I want to show you some things important. Hebrews 7, 20. Hebrews 7, 20. And inasmuch... Now watch this. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath. That's the priest of Aaron, all the priests in the Old Testament. None of them were priests because none of them became a priest because God swore an oath. See? But this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 1 that he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Declared. Did he become the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. 
but he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. The declaration could have been a verbal declaration, probably was, but the declaration also included the fact that he was alive, the fact that he existed, the fact that he entered into the spirit world where angels could see him, principalities, powers, all of the wickedness of this world could know that he was alive from the dead. That was a declaration that he was the Son of God. But something else took place. He was ordained, if you want to use that terminology, and I probably would because God's doing the ordination. He was ordained into the priesthood as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this took place when God swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. He swore by himself. He could swear by none greater that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The power of his priesthood lies not in cardinal or uh, uh, carnal ordinances and the limited life of the individual on earth. The power of his priesthood lies in an endless life. Yeah, that's a strong thing, an endless life. There was something to do, and I don't know exactly if I can, if I can, I just think about it, but there had, there had to be something, there was something going on between the life of the high priest and the life of the individual that, in the Old Testament and their relationship with God. Because if you remember, if you killed a man, if you were guilty of shedding blood, you could flee to one of the cities of refuge, six of them, three on the east side of Jordan, three on the west. You could flee there. If you were found innocent by the, by, by the elders, you stayed in that city of refuge and the avenger of the brethren or the avenger of blood could not cross that line. If he went into that city and got you, he was guilty of murder and would be tried as a murderer. So you were safe, but you had to stay there until the high priest died. And then at the death of the high priest, you were free to go out. So there had to be something to do with the high priest and your life connected with his life. And it probably had something to do with the breastplate that he wore. He had 12 stones on that breastplate. And each one of those stones represented one of the 12 tribes of Israel. He also had epaulets on his shoulder, which had six on one, six on the other, that represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Therefore, he was a physical living representative of all of Israel and everyone that lived. His life represented their life. He bore them on his heart. And he died in their stead. Yes, he did. And they were free after his death. That's exactly right. And that's what Christ did. Yeah. You see, you jumped on into it wow. and saw the connection. <laughs> that's what happened. Amen. He bore them and he died for them. And once he died for them, they were free. Amen. But anyway, these priests were made without an oath, but Christ by an oath. And it was God swearing by himself, because there's none greater to swear by, that he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7.22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. That's a guarantee, and that's a, that's, a, that's a down payment. That's a sealing document. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. So therefore... He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So your salvation is a progressive thing. Your new birth is instantaneous. That's important. Did you get that? Your salvation has to do with your soul, sanctification. It has to do with a victorious Christian life, your walk with the Lord, and your eventual glorification in the presence of God. That's your salvation. Your new birth is an instantaneous event. At the moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and accept Him into your heart, you have changed from a child of hell to a child of God. That cannot change. That's the new birth. But that tells you that you're dealing with a man that is more than just, the man is a spirit that has a soul that lives in a body. And the soul is what is being saved. And so this is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of our great high priest because of his life. His life at the right hand of the Father that is exemplified by what he lived on this earth. That life is what God ministers grace through to you. 
because of who Christ is. Amen. Hallelujah to God. That's why he's able to save to the uttermost. That means that doesn't make a difference what your problem is, where you came from, how bad off in sin you are. God can lift you up, and He does not make a distinction from one or the other. In Christ, there's neither male nor female, bond nor free, uh, Jew, Gentile, any of that. That you lose racial distinction, you lose ethnic distinction, you lose political distinction, you lose monetary distinction. In Christ Jesus, there's no difference. You're either in Him or you're not. If you're in Him, you're a son of God by the new birth. Amen. And men don't like that. But that's what the Bible teaches. In Hebrews 9, 12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood He entered in once the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. You see how that it is in His priesthood that He's the Savior. See that? That's important because the connection is made in the priesthood that He is the Savior. And so the Lord God makes a covenant with Himself. And I find that fascinating. I do. Because he intends for it to be done. <laughs> and no man, he, can, he can't make a covenant with a man because a man can't last that long. <laughs> so he makes it with himself. From everlasting to everlasting, the eternal I am. <laughs> he swears by himself because there's none greater. One of those times that he swore that, it was to Abraham. He said, because thou hast done this thing. From then on, all that believe will be children of Abraham. Then when he raised Christ from the dead, he swore by himself that he would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Nobody can take from that. That's elevation to the priesthood. Uh, none like him. None like him before, none like him since. So when God swears by himself, get ready, some heavy duty stuff's fixing to happen. <laughs> That's about the best way I know how to put it. Some heavy duty stuff. He swears by Himself. You know what all that means? That means I'm born again by the grace of God, and God says that He's going to keep me. And Paul, sw Paul says, I am persuaded He's able to keep that which I've committed to Him against that day. Amen. 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 I'm going to close with this tonight. I find, it, I find this thing remarkable. That's re here's why I find it remarkable, because it means so much to some people, and it doesn't mean a thing to me. It's not an issue. How many's ever heard where Cain got his wife? How many's ever heard somebody say to you, "I don't believe the Bible because uh, it, the Bible does." The Bible said Cain went out and took his wife, and uh, said, where did he get his wife? If 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 uh, you know if 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 Cain and Abel and Seth and Cain killed Abel and all you had was Cain and Seth and and you have this genealogy and that genealogy, where does wife come from? He went to the east. He went to the land of Nod. You know, and took his wife. Uh, here's an exchange that took place in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee, between Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan's on the witness stand. Darrow says, Did you ever consider where Cain got his wife? This is in a court of law now. No, sir, I'll leave the agnostics to hunt for her. <laughs> That's a clever little quip, but the problem is that didn't answer the question. <laughs> uh, the question, you have never found out? He wasn't amused, of course. The answer, I have never tried to find. Question, you have never tried to find? Brian answers, no. Darrow says, the Bible says he got one, doesn't it? Were there other people on earth at that time? Watch this. Answer, I cannot say. Question, you cannot say, did that ever enter your consideration? Answer, never bothered me. Question, there were no others recorded, but Cain got a wife. Answer, that's what the Bible says. Question, where she came from, you do not know. Thus ended the exchange. Now what, what happened? It wasn't William Jennings Bryan on trial then. It was the Bible on trial then. The veracity of the Scripture, see. And the point was, the whole point was, which is what Darrow was trying to do. Darrow was trying to say, you are a country bumpkin lawyer that believes that the Bible 
is a, is a revelation from God, is the Word of God. And I am down here to try to represent intelligence and progressive intelligence and understanding and science and so forth. And these backwood pe backwoods people here in Tennessee who have on the law books against the teaching of evolution, all based on a book that, has, that is full of errors and misconceptions and myths and old wives' fables. That was the whole point in all of this. That was the whole point. Where did Cain get his wife? Where did Abraham get his wife? What was Sarah's relationship with Abraham before he married her? Abraham says plainly, we have the same father, we've got different mothers. So what does that make them? Yeah, Abimelech. Yeah. The king of Gerar, Philistine. Yeah, Abimelech. Now look, if Cain married his sister, you would say, well, now that's against the law of God. It is against the law of God. When did the law of God show up? When did, when did the law show up? Moses. When, 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 give me a date on Moses. 14, 1500 B.C., you say. I usually say 1400, all right? All right. When are we talking about here? We're talking about 900 to 1,000 years before that. All right. 2400, well, more than that. We're, talk, we're talking about 2,000 years almost before that. Okay? We're talking about long before the law of God was ever given. We're also talking about antediluvian people. We're talking about people who lived almost 1,000 years. We're talking about the absence of the genetic problems that are associated with, with, with uh, brother and sister and all that. And I'm not up here to not advocating that. I'm telling you right now, it's wrong. The Bible, the, the law of God plainly says it is, but back when he made the first man, Adam, and Eve, he said, was the mother of all living. You've got one man, one woman. Everybody was born from those two. Everybody walking this earth. So therefore, and, and it's not unusual at all for women not even to be recorded in their birth. There's only one woman in the whole Bible whose death is recorded, at, at, whose age is recorded at her death. Do you know who that is? Sarah, the only one, the whole Bible. The whole Bible, folks. So it's not unusual for a woman to not even be recorded. So where did Cain get his wife? He took a sister. That's where he got his wife. He took a sister, and she became his wife. And the children were born from that. And so it goes. This is, this is the beginning of humanity. There's nowhere else to go. One man, one woman, all the, everybody came from that one man, one woman. And I have a problem with that at all. Do you have a problem with that? I got no problem with that. That's, what, that's exactly what the Bible says. No law, no transgression. So it doesn't bother me. How many ever heard of Carl Sagan? Here's a scientist. Now we got a lawyer on one hand, now we got a scientist. I'll read this and finish up tonight. In recent times, the same example is taken up by Carl Sagan in his book, Contact, which was on the New York Times bestseller list, used the movie of the same name based upon this work. Satan, uh, Sagan, Sagan cleverly listed a number of common questions, including Cain's wife that are often directed at Christians in an attempt to supposedly prove the Bible full of contradictions and can't be defended. Even Sagan went down the Cain's wife path. Why did they do that? Of course. Why do they want to prove it wrong? See, that's the real problem. I, don't, I think it was Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens that said it. I'm not sure. You know, Huckleberry Finn and all that. I'm not sure he was, but, but somebody said this. It's not the stuff in the Bible I understand. Yeah. That I, I don't understand that bothers me. He said, it's the stuff in the Bible I do understand. <laughs> Those two guys would have been great additions to the revision committees. Yeah, wouldn't they? Yeah. That's about the attitude of most of the revival. Right. Now, would you stake your eternity on the fact that you didn't know where Cain got his wife? <laughs> Seriously, folks. Would you throw out a book right there like that whole Bible because you, because you don't know where Cain got his wife? That's insanity. Yes, sir. 930 years, there's a lot of 
That's how long. That's how long the Bible says that, that Adam lived. Nine hundred thirty years. A whole lot of children can be born. Adam could easily have had a thousand grandchildren. Two thousand. Ten thousand. He would have had great grandchildren. He would have had great great grandchildren. He would have had great 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 grandchildren. His family could have filled Knoxville, Tennessee. When they had a family reunion. <laughs> Do what? Cain could have been, you know, seven hundred years old and his wife been four fifty or something, you know. Well, sure. <laughs> Well, that's very, no, that's a good point because there's nothing in that book of Genesis that tells you how long a time transpired between the time that he was cast out and he took a wife. Exactly. Nothing said about that. No, you just jump to conclusions, and that's a bad thing to do. Amen. His descendants could have filled New York City. <laughs> what do they got up there, seven or eight million now? Well, I'm talking about his immediate family, you know. Family, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You remember what I told you about the electric eel? I, I, I read about that thing about a couple of years ago. Electric eel. That thing can hit you with 600 volts. Now, folks, there's only 120 over here. There's 220 back here on this panel running at 60 hertz. 220 volts, 60 hertz, all right? Uh, 600 volts of DC current. In other words, this, AC, this is AC. DC, you're getting a double dose, okay? Now, tell me something. Water conducts electricity. How does that eel, when it puts out 600 volts, keep from electro electrocuting itself? That's true. <laughs> that's a good. That's a, that's a good a good uh, a good thing right there. Fools can ask all kinds of questions. Yes, sir. Was it was it, it was broadcast live on the radio in 1925? Yes. Okay. I didn't know that. That's important because the whole nation then was listening. Oh yeah. No, I know it. You know what the ACLU, now they chose this as a test case, you know that. And the ACLU's argument was that it's not right to teach only one view of, of origins or creation or what terminology they might have used. That's what they said back in 1925. Now, pardon? This is important, folks. What he's saying is very important. Why? It shows you the methodology that these people use. In 1925, they said the schools should be opened up to explore all the different avenues and venues of understanding, approaches to creation, what have you. Now, in 2013, once they've become entrenched, just one view. You see what I mean? The way it works is they, take, they use your freedoms to take your freedoms. That, yeah. Ben Stein's a Jew, and he believes the Old Testament. Yeah. 
mention the word uh, creation. They're done forever. Yeah. Black balls are done. They're black balls. Yeah. Right. It's their income. It's their livelihood. And there are many of them, no doubt, that don't buy into it, but they keep their mouth shut because they want to, they want to keep a job. Do you know, how many of you know what's going on in Turkey right now? Istanbul, the crossroads of the world, Istanbul, the itmus there, the Istanbul. How many know what's going on in Turkey? How many know what's really going on in Turkey? When they first started reporting that 13, 14 days ago when this thing started, it was about the young people uprise, an uprising among the young people because they wanted to take a park, one of the last parks that they've got in, in, in Istanbul, which had greenery in it, trees, what have you, and convert it into buildings and, and, and you know, commercial usage, what have you, shopping center. That's what they started reporting to people. You know what it's about? The Prime Minister of Turkey, his name is Erdogan. He is a Muslim. He is under the process of trying to transform Turkey back into what used to be the Ottoman Empire. You see, uh, Constantinople, Byzantium, Istanbul was the headquarters of the, of the Ottoman Empire, which, was, which lasted over a thousand years and came to its end in World War I. The Ottoman Empire was a long-lasting thing. And he's trying to take these young Turks, he's trying to take these young Turks who have had a taste of freedom. And once you get a taste of freedom, you don't want to give it up. And he's trying to bring, gradually work Sharia Islamic Islamization into the country. And they are rebelling. And it's been going on for about two years. Yeah, it didn't just start, but it's coming to a head. See, I mean, these people are, are voicing their grievance because, like you say, this didn't happen yesterday. They were, something, well, something that happened yesterday is not going to make these kids so mad. They're mad. This is something that's been going on for some time. Oh, yeah, it happened in Iran. And they didn't support them. And they could have. They had quite an uprising going on there. And they could have, they could have, they could have intervened and helped those uh, people in Iran. The people in Iran are Persian, folks. They're not Arabs. They're Persian. And uh, they're Shia Muslim, Shiite Muslims. Uh, and, of course, you know how Muslims evangelize. And do you know how they operate? Here's how they operate. They come into a nation like America that has a constitution, has freedoms, First Amendment freedoms, you know, the First Amendment freedom of, of, of expression, freedom of, of you can gather together, freedom of religion, First Amendment. They use that to get a foothold in that nation. You know, oh, we're brothers, we're friends, you know, we believe in freedom of religion, we believe in this and that, until they have enough power and they'll do exactly what they did in Armenia back in the early 1900s. They'll take over. And once they take over, I'll tell you what's something to do, and I'll shut up. This is very important. I just got into this and hadn't had time to do much research into it. But Saddam Hussein, Hosni Mubarak, and Hafas Assad, who's the daddy of the, of the, of the one over there in Syria right now, these are all three dictators of Arab countries, big Arab countries, influential Arab countries, all right? Did you know that Christians underneath these dictators were in better shape than they are today under the Islamist? Yes, they are. Yes, they were. They, they were. Syria, I was reading an article two or three years ago about a a group of pilgrims that came from Syria to Jerusalem. And they were coming down to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and places in Jerusalem. And the pilgrims, these are Christians now, coming out of Syria, probably Syrian Orthodox, like, you know, the Greek Orthodox, so forth. But they're coming into Israel. And they were talking about how much freedom and how much they lacked Assad. And this is something that I read two years ago. They were talking about how that they had freedom. Here they're making a pilgrimage. They can go back to their country. They can travel. And Assad, a dictator, gave them this freedom. Now, how much freedom do you think they're going to have when this bunch of rebels, if they take over that country? How much freedom do you think they'll have? How much freedom are they having in Egypt right now? Do you know what they're doing to the Coptic churches down there in Egypt? 
They're killing those cops or burning their churches to the ground. <laughs> yes, they are. So <clears throat> what you should do is look at Turkey and say to yourself, here are young people, early 20s, 20s, in their 20s, who a lot of them, on the time they're growing up, all they've known is freedom. And now they've got to dictate, they've got to, well, he was uh, uh, democratically elected, but he's becoming a dictator who is going to bring them back under Islamization or Islamic law. They don't like it. That's what's going on in Turkey. Don't you think America would learn a lesson from that? Could we learn a lesson from it? Ask those people down there in Murfreesboro. Ask the people in Murfreesboro. They had a meeting down there the other day, and uh, a bunch of those people got together in that meeting, just people like us, just working people. And they had an FBI was there and somebody else representing the, the Muslim, uh, one Muslim organization, and they met down there. And, they, uh, and the idea, the whole the point was that we want to show you how that we can work together as a community and uh, trying to build a relationship, you know, and bridges and so forth. And man, those people down there started yelling and screaming down there in Murfreesboro. I think it's Murfreesboro. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. They started yelling and screaming and letting the FBI and the, and the, and the Islamic group and the rest of them know what they thought about it. They're not stupid. <laughs> It's like those, those country people up there in the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina and, uh, where the, they went in there and started preaching from the NIV and NASV and all the rest of that. And those people said to them, we want a real Bible. <laughs> There's only one real Bible to those people. It's that one right there. You don't have to have a Ph.D. to know when something speaks to you. Amen. Father, in thy name we pray. I pray you bless the study of your word, the time we've had together, Lord, here in the house of God, and fellowship with our people. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, before we leave, you might have a prayer request. We'll take a, just take a couple of minutes.